Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. Again, it's either your business or it's God's business. And we know one person would be better to run it than the other. And if you're someone who thinks that you're better at running the business than God would be, then maybe this is not the show for you. Today is a solo episode that's going to be all around this concept of making your offer more valuable, uh, increasing your prices, or simply just selling more. So often I see inside of the marketplace, we get lazy with our products and services because again, frankly, we're just in the weeds. Uh, one thing that I've noticed more than anything is that the reason I have great mentors around me and, and friends and people that could speak in my life and great counsel is because inside of my life, I get so in the weeds, meaning inside of my business, that oftentimes I can't see the little nuances. Whereas if I look at someone else's business, and maybe you can relate as well, all of a sudden I can see wow, I know exactly what's going on in their business. I know what they should do different. I know what their offer should be. I know how they should market. You have all the answers for everyone else, but maybe you don't have the answers for yourself. That is very, very common, which is why you should have great people or listen to great things that give you different perspective and kind of shake you or shock you into doing something a little bit different. And I have a few examples of that today where we're going to redefine what your product or service is, what you sell, what's your product or service. We're going to redefine that for you. I'm going to give you a few tips on things that you could do to increase the value that ultimately will either make your price seem lower or we could figure out the exact model that's best for you. And so I remember having a guy in 2017 come up to my office and I do these things called VIP days. I try not to do them as much anymore, but people come over to my office. We sit here all day. We map out whatever in their business that's most specific and needed inside of lead generation, lead nurture, conversions, deliverable, retention, resell, and upsell or ascension and figure out what's going to be the things that really produce money inside of the company. And then what's the structure around that that needs to be done to be able to make that happen. And so I had this guy come up, he was a dog trainer. He'd already done so good, right? So this would be more service. He was someone that would train dogs on Craigslist, walking them. And then he started doing training for dogs where he did these like $125 in-person sessions. And then he would do these $150, $125 socialization where you get your dog around other dogs. And then you could buy a leash and you could buy a training collar and training tools. And I was like, okay, like what, what's the biggest problem? And he said, well, I'm so good at what I do. And this would be for the coaches, the consultants, the people that teach, uh, maybe even people that work hourly on projects. I'm so good at what I do that I get paid less than the guy that's bad because I usually fix a dog in just one session, whereas other people are slower. So they take multiple ses sessions, but I'm stuck in the same category. And for everyone out there, like, there is a market price for what people are selling your stuff for. But that does not mean if you fall into that market price, then that's your fault, right? There's like, there's going to the golf course for 30 bucks. And then there's the country club for a 250,000 initiation fee. That's private club. It's still golfing at a golf course. There's a complete difference there. So why can one golf course have 250,000 initiation fee? Another one could have 15,000 initiation fee. And the other one could be a public course that you pay $30 to golf in the afternoon and anyone can do it. What is the difference? What, why is there whiskey that is a thousand dollars for a shot? And then you have whiskey that is, you know, $8 or whatever the heck that it is for a shot. What, what is the difference? It is the same exact product. The way that you drink, it's exactly the same. It's the same amount. <laughs> it probably is the same alcohol content. Like what is the difference inside of those different products? And so what are the things that I look at no matter what, when we're creating a new product is we're looking at is there a market for it, right? So you look at inside of the market that I fit into, are people actually buying? And that'd be something called like a market cap. And I have a great guy inside of King's Brotherhood that is taught really in depth on this and I'll just brush over it. So inside of the market cap, so is there a market for it? What is the market cap? Because we want to make sure that people are actually spending money on those things. And you're not just going out there and trying to create a brand new product that people are not spending money on. You're going to convince the world that you need to start spending your money here. It's a lot easier to get people that are already spend money on their yard to go spend money on their yard, right? So it's easy to get people that already invest in personal development to buy into personal development, et cetera. So there's that. And then inside of that, there's people that are committed to certain brands. They love the brand that they're in and that those people are not going to shift. Like there are people that just absolutely love, even if that's not the best product or service, they're just obsessed with it, right? This would be like car brands, it'd be golf brands. This would be types of clothes. Even if it's not the best pair of clothes, they're so diehards to the brand, the vision. Those are not the people we want to convince out of it because that's like the hardest thing to do is to convince people that love what they have to go to something else. And I've had that happen. People knock on my door 
I'm like, oh, I love the people that I'm with right now. And they're trying to convince me out of them to just move on to the next one because there's people that are indifferent. But then there's also the hot market of people that are actually upset with the current product or service that they have right now. And this is how you can do some market research on how you can get a piece of that market of people that are upset with how people are delivering what they're currently getting. And this is very popular in Amazon. If you actually go to amazon.com and you go check out a product that you normally buy, what you can do is you can go to any product and you can look at the one star section. What will you find in the one star section? People that bought the product. So that means they need it. They've invested money. They're in the market, yet they're unhappy. And one of the easiest things people would do back in the day is that they would just take all the one star reviews and they would figure out a way to compile that, put that into their messaging and solve the problem. So if it was a can opener and, and there was someone who was frail, that wasn't very strong and they weren't good at twisting the can opener, they'd be like, are you sick and tired of that? We've created a can opener that is electric. And so because of that, it now takes all the customers, right? You're not going and trying to get people that don't buy can openers to go buy can openers. You're getting people that already buy can openers and you're selling them the product that's going to be a five-star rather than a one-star. You're not trying to convince the five-star to buy your product over the other product because they're already satisfied and happy with the current product that they have. So that's number one is making sure that there is some sort of market cap inside of that. Now let's redefine what product or service is. I like to call it an offer. Uh, there's a great guy named Alex Ramosi that wrote a book called 100M Offers. I don't think that I finished the whole thing, but I know I've known him for a long time and he has great things on this. I think it's so crucial because when I look at the beginning of the sales process and teach sales scripts and do sales consulting, a lot of times I have to go back to what is the actual offer? Because it's like, what's the offer? How do we attract the leads? Because that entire process is going to affect not just that that little tiny process of when does someone talk to the prospect to the close? That is a very little small chink on the wheel, the, the small cog in the entire wheel of how an engine works. I want to figure out from the very beginning, the entire process all the way to when they buy and they get delivered and then they refer. And I want to figure out that entire process. And a lot of times that offer really affects that entire process. So what, when I look at offer, I just think about for the clientele on the other side of the computer on the phone in the meeting is how can they have more certainty of outcome? How can I give them more certainty that they will get that result that they want? And the more certainty they have, the more likely they are to buy. Like if you were to ask people, if it's not about time or money, or if this was guaranteed to work for you, which I wouldn't talk about, but if I were to ask people that, a lot of them were like, oh yeah, this is guaranteed to work for me. I'd be willing to pay this. But because there's so much risk, there's so much unknown, there's so much uncertainty, that's why it's so difficult for people to get out their credit card and swipe is because they're like, oh, I'm just looking for that certainty. I'm just looking for someone that will take the risk. And these are all things to remember as well. So offer is more so certainty of outcome. Uh, and the value of the product or service that you sell right now is actually the value of the transformation that you create. And that's how a lot of people will try to price their products just based on market price. I think you have to look at market price, look at what other people are doing, figure out what's going to be your competitive advantage. Can you do, are you way less than other people? I did this once in a, uh, a podcast post-production format. I was able to beat everyone's price points because I was using that for lead gen for something else. So am I going to beat everyone's prices? Am I going to maybe serve people in a way that other people aren't serving? This would be like, if everyone just has digital products, you're going to add coaching. And so that coaching may increase your price point, but people are really longing for that. Is there something that you can do to uh, increase the chance that the person gets the transformation of the outcome? So the way that I do that or figure out what the transformation is, is I do a chart called, uh, I call it product confidence multiplier. It's something I teach inside of my a billion dollar sales master course. It's a course that I have on selling. And inside of that, I talk about that you write out what are your clients struggling with right now, one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, and go really in depth. And if they were struggling with this, what would happen? If they struggled with this, what would happen? I figure out what all the struggles are personally in the business, et cetera. Then I figure out what right now are you going to do different than all your competitors? Because I want to look at my competitors and the people that are all just in the market, people that have a market share I want to figure out, should I be promoting their stuff or do I actually have a difference? Do I, do I reach people that they don't? Do I serve them in a different way? Which one is it? Because either you serve people the same way, but you reach people that they can't. Maybe it's your story. Maybe it's your, it's your location. Or you serve them in a different way. And so because of that, you can go into the market and be confident because you're like, they aren't serving people in this way. This would be your one-star reviews. Lastly, I go through... If they buy your product or service right now, what's their life like right away in a year, 
three years, and in five years. And if I want to find the value, I take the difference of the lives from the very first question and the, and the last question. That's the value. What would they pay to jump from life to life? And if there was certainty in that, that's like the, the highest potential value for your product or service. So that is how I start getting confidence in my product or service, not based on market price and all of these other things, because it's really irrelevant. It's like price is only a problem when value is a mystery. So I'll ask you this question. What's the best way right now that you can decrease price? One, you can decrease price. Pretty obvious. Second, you can increase value to make the price seem smaller. I always ask people if there was a house for sale in Orange County for 50,000 bucks and the next door neighbor's house was 4 million plus, would you buy it? And everyone says, absolutely, I would buy that house. Go, why? It's 50,000 freaking dollars. Like, isn't 50 grand a lot? Like if I were to just ask people straight up, is 50K a lot of money? People would say, yeah, that's a lot of money. If you were to go to Vegas and spend it, put it on red and lose it, it's a lot of money. People would say, yes. So, okay, great. If you were to retire at 65, you had 50K to live off of for the rest of your life. Is that a lot of money? No, that's not a lot of money. Okay. Buying the house in Orange County, is that a lot of money? No, it's not a lot of money. So is 50K a lot of money or not a lot of money? Uh, it just depends. Because at the end of the day, it just depends what you're buying. If it's a $4 million house for 50 grand, everyone would raise money like crazy because of the value of the house. If it's 50K for a piece of paper that you don't need, does not matter. Right? Like, but if you're in the middle of the desert and you're and you're literally thirsting and going to die, you'd pay 50 grand if you had it to get more water to live. Now all of a sudden a water bottle becomes 50 grand. Which is absolutely insane. So, the value is only a pro or the price is only a problem when value is a mystery and there's only two ways to decrease price, decrease it or increase value to make sure that the price seems smaller. So what we did with that dog trainer back in the day is that $125 product, $125 other product $10 this, $80 that, $200 this. What we did is we created an offer that gave certainty of outcome. Certainty of outcome, I want to have the offer that's going to get them the results that they want. And I want to make sure in that offer that there's things to equip them that overcome their internal and external objections. So their internal objection is going to be why they think it won't work for them. So inside of selling, for instance, they would think, well, I'm not really good on my feet. I don't know how to speak on camera. I'm not really great on the phone. So because of that, this, that disqualifies me from buying Nicholas Barely's service to get consulting for my sales process because I'm just not a good salesperson. I just need to hire someone else to do it. And so what I need to do is I need to equip them inside of that. What you're going to want to do is equip them inside of the product. And I'll give, I'll be like, Hey, here's someone who was way worse than you who did this. So now they're like, I can do it. So a testimonial that overcomes the objection, but I also want to equip them. So I'd be like, Hey, here's the exact sales script that if you just ask the right questions, the prospect will tell you the answers and end up buying. Oh, I can ask questions. That's not bad. I thought I had to talk a lot and be persuasive and overcome objections. Nope. When you do it right, you can have a great offer overcome objections prior to people getting on the phone. And that way, when they get on the phone, they're just an idiot if they don't buy. People are like, I can do that. So that's an internal objection. The external objection would be things outside of themselves. So they would think, you know, if it's a dog training company and the one that they see prospering is in a town of a million and they're in a town of 8,000, they're like, oh, I get it. I can do it. I get the product works, but it won't work in my city because there's not enough people. So I'd want to have a testimonial that shows someone in a very small town prospering but also I'd want to figure out a way that I can equip them to prosper even in a small town. And that'd be like how to run a dog, successful dog training company on 100 clients or less. So we're going to show you how to get your first 100 clients, which is able to do in any style or how big your audience is. So, and for mine, it'd be similar. It'd be like, okay, I get it. I can sell. I can do all that. But I don't have an audience like Nicholas. So even if I promote something, no one will listen. So I'd show them how I did $180,000 off of 61 leads. I'd be like, do you think you can get 61 leads? Do you have more than 100 people following you on all social media? And can you reach out to them and sell them? So it's like, all of a sudden, now I could show them how they could get 61 leads and hit a goal that they have. That becomes more attainable. And now, now that overcomes their objection, but also I equip them inside of the offer. And so what we did together is we created a package and we created something called risk reversal or guarantees. So a guarantee that you probably have seen before is like, you know, money back guarantee, 30 day satisfaction guarantee, double money back guarantee. There, there's a million different styles out there. You want to figure out one that really just decreases the risk of the person on the other end. So when you go to Costco, people love buying at Costco because they know they can use that thing for however long they want and still return it and get their money back. So people will buy things that they don't want or even need because they're like, ah, oh, like worst case scenario, I just take it back. And Costco's realizing that more people will buy if you do this or have that guarantee. 
because it puts the risk on the store that we're really good at what we do rather than the other person. So for this dog trainer specifically, we actually bundled everything that he had, made it 500 bucks. So that's like triple, quadruple what he was doing before, exactly quadruple. Package it all together and put a guarantee on it that in one session, your dog will be fixed or else you don't pay for more sessions or you get your money back. Obviously, people are going to pay just get the free sessions. So if it takes two sessions, he would have made 250 bucks. Now he's making 500. If he gets it in one, now he's making 500 because of the guarantee, because of the certainty of outcome, and because of the value of the training. Also, it allows him to stand out compared to everyone else and go to a buyer that's more results-driven rather than value-driven. There's people out there that are value-driven. They just want a million videos, and they don't care what it does for them as long as it comes with a lot of stuff. There's other people out there that just want one video if it gives them what they need. They just want that one experience if it gives them what they need. And so there's different types of buyers out there. I personally like to go with the result buyer, the outcome buyer, because that person's looking to get the thing that they want. They don't really care about the process in order to get there. If it takes one workout to be fit, that's great. If it takes a million, then that's great as well. They don't really care. They just care about the outcome. So that offer gives certainty of outcome. The value is the the difference of the two people, the transformation they're going to get. We can decrease price through decreasing price or increasing value. And, and inside of that, I want to make sure that I set up my offer in that way. So I think about that with everything that you do. I look at market cap. I look at what the transformation is. I figure out what the price point of that transformation is. I figure out what does it take to create that transformation. I break that down into simple steps and go, this is what it takes. But what objections would they have? How can I put a testimonial plus a bonus inside of this offer to increase the value, but also overcome their objection? So when they get to the end of it, just from your offer, they're going, this is giving me exactly what I want. The process to get there is detailed and valuable to get me there. It makes sense. I know it'll work for me because of the examples plus the equipping that they give me. And I know it'll work in my current situation because of the situations that they've shown me and the equipping that they give me for it to actually help in my exact situation. It's like they're reading my mind that literally if they don't buy your product or service, they're going to be like, why didn't I buy that? I don't have any hesitancy at that point. It's just their, their own junk. And that's where the closer can come in. This is where the salesperson, this is where the presentation, this is where the extra report, this is where the follow-up can come in, is where it's like, hey, I saw that you didn't buy. Is there some question or something that you need clarity on? Is this actually true what you guys say? Yes, it is actually true. It comes with this money-back guarantee. It comes with this end-of-event money-back guarantee. I run these events where literally people can invest, come to the event for King's Brotherhood. They can come to the event, eat all the food, stay, list all the speakers, connect all the people, get all the stuff. And if they didn't think it was worth it, which is just arbitrary, like it's just based on their, what they believe, if they don't think it was worth it, they could have all their money back. I was like, I don't care about your money. Like I ain't going to transform my life, but you being in the room could transform your life. So there's no risk. It's all on me. See what that does? Now it's really only them get, they can self-sabotage because they reached out because they want something. If I made it, hey, there's no money back. Like, oh, what if it doesn't work for me? Like, no. Let me make the offer good. Let me overcome the internal and external objections. And then let me stamp a little guarantee on it. And that way that I'm taking all the risks to get more people in the door. Will I have people abuse that? Yes, but I'm getting 10 more people in the door for the one that's going to abuse it. So nine nine more good people, which is going to help you dominate inside of your industry. So again, right now, if you're lazy on your product or service, let's make it an offer, which gives more certainty of outcome increasing value to make the price seem even lower and bundling in a way where you can really stand out inside of your marketplace. If you're super hype price for no good reason, <laughs> this is the way that you can actually add validity to why you're so high priced. And if you're very low priced right now, this is your calling to add more value to your customer service, maybe even increasing price point, but it'll actually seem less inside of your client's eyes. I've done this many, many times before. The clients are happier because they're actually getting more of what they want because they're not just buying because of price or value. They're buying because of outcome and what it's going to give them and the certainty of that. The more certainty you give them, the more valuable it is. Again, if this was valuable to you, you know this was a little bit uh, different than our normal cha like pace of interviewing and me doing a solo episode. I just felt like out of the conversations I was having recently, I was like, man, people could really master just making great offers, certainty of outcome over just products or services that give them more value. So if this was valuable, hit subscribe on YouTube. Make sure to ring that bell. Drop a comment below if you have any questions on this. Happy to get back to you. If you're listening on the podcast version, you can head back and forth. Whether you're on YouTube, head to the podcast side, 
on either Apple Podcasts like iTunes or on Spotify or any any streaming platform. Hit subscribe there as well. And if it's valuable, leave a rate and review. It just means a ton. Happy to answer any questions there as well. Also, I'm at Nicholas Barely on Instagram. Feel free to send me a message and happy to answer questions and connect there with the people inside of God's business. Because again, when we put God first, he's the multiplier of our success. And using, just as Solomon used, said, where's the best bronze worker? When he was building the temple, he's where's the best bronze worker? He brought him in because he had a worldly skill set, a skill set with his hands that he was blessed to do. And he added value inside of the selling. I have a gifting inside of this area and I'm happy to serve you guys. So appreciate you guys for supporting God's business and see you guys on the next episode.